ओम सरशव सरशवसमारंभा शंकराचार्य मध्यमा अस्मराचार्यपर्यता वंदे गुरुपरंपरा ओम गुड प्लीज बी सीटेड ओम परमेश्वर सहनावतु सहनौ भुन सह वीर्यन खरवाह तेजस्वीनावधिमस्तु मिषावह ओ शाति 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 Very good. Nice to see you all. Welcome also to the many students who regularly are attending these classes online. Uh we continue today with our study of chapter 11, which looks remarkably similar to chapter 10 of the Bhagavad Gita, Vibhuti Yoga. In this chapter we see a long narration of by Shri Krishna of his vibhutis of his glories. and it's wonderful first of all it's very very poetic much of the uh, much of our vedantic texts are very didactic they're engaged in all this uh, intense teaching upadesha these verses are anything but didactic very poetic very lovely and <clears throat> the imagery and ideas shri krishna is conveying here are meant for two purposes as we've discussed before and just to remind us one is all these all these vibhutis are meant for meditation any one or more of these you can take you can read a verse that's a nice idea read a verse and sit and meditate next day read the next verse sit and meditate next day read the next verse that'll keep you going for a, more than a month <laughs> to go through this uh this uh chapter and each verse actually has usually four different ideas involved so you can stretch it out if you want um so these vibhutis are narrated for the sake of meditation also for the sake of appreciation in our day-to-day lives um why should we reserve appreciation of ishwara's glories why should we reserve that only to meditation why not do it now and as we did in our earlier meditation session where we appreciated the incredible brilliance of the mind and brain and just the more the more you think about thinking the more amazing it becomes and i i still rem- it, it it's interesting now that i'm a little older i can so much more relate to many things my guru said long ago so i after a class sometimes i would say that was brilliant how did you do that and he'd say yeah it was great and without any and he would explain that he made no effort whatsoever in whatever the brilliance was it was clearly ishwara's glories in the form of his mind and body unfolding this brilliant teaching and you know so there's no pride involved in it at all for him so if i said that was brilliant he's like yeah <laughs> <laughs> it, it really was of course acknowledging ishwara as the source of that brilliance and decades later i understand so well because this kind of teaching what i what i share with you is nothing that you can really plan out you can't write it out and all of this stuff ahead of time it's very spontaneous and 
as I'm teaching, pretty often something comes out that surprises me. And every time that happens, I realize it's not me. This is, this is Ishvara. Ishvara manifest in our day-to-day -day lives. How lovely to appreciate that. You can appreciate that when you're at work on your computer. Wow, look at that. <laughs> Seriously. Acknowledge the greatness of your work, but give that glory to the true source, to Ishvara. That's, a, that's the idea here. Okay, with that introduction, I think we can continue where we left off. All right. Tirtanham srota sam ganga. Tirtanham srota sam ganga. Samudra sarasamaham. Samudra sarasamaham. Ayudhanam dhanuraham. Ayudhanam dhanuraham. Tripuragno dhanushmatam. Tripuragno dhanushyatam. And just to remind you, the format of most of these verses is among these, I am the best. Among those, I am the best. So looking at every category of existence and looking at the greatest of the members of those categories and looking at those, Sri Krishna says, I am manifest. Of course, does that mean manif uh, Krishna is not manifest in the mediocre? <laughs> we know that's not true. So Krishna is everything. Ishvara is, is everything. As my guru said, it's not that there's one God, there is only God. And that perspective is really the basis for this entire chapter, which means Ishvara is present in the epitome of existence, but Ishvara is also present in the middle, the so-called mediocre, and even at the bottom of the pile, so to speak. Ishvara is manifest in all these ways, but it's easier for us to appreciate Ishvara's glorious in the epitome of what exists. And that's what we continue to see here. So, tirtanam, srotasam. Srotasam, among rivers, that which flows is srotas. And these rivers, not just ordinary rivers, but tirtas. Tirta, <coughs> you may know the word as a place of pilgrimage. It literally means where you cross over. And cross over from where? If you go to a Tirtha, you cross over from this mundane world to a spiritual world, a divine world. So that's the idea. Tirtha is a crossing point. So this is where you cross over beyond worldliness and reach something beyond the world. So the Ganga, not surprisingly, among all rivers, is held as being the most sacred for, and this has been true just from the origins of Hinduism, I think in the Rig Veda itself, you'll find hymns in which Ganga is glorified. And thank goodness that the government of India and NGOs are finally taking care of the Ganga. They've got a long way to go. Like many rivers, the Ganga has been seriously polluted step by step, gradually, that's being taken care of. So hopefully in the future, we will know that the sacred Ganga is not only pure in a spiritual sense, but it's pure in a worldly sense as well. Next one, Samudraha Sarasam Aham. Sri Krishna says, Aham, I am Sarasam among all bodies of water, I am the samudra, the sea, the biggest body of water. Interesting, um, we, we take so many things for granted. When you go to a sea, ocean, or a really large lake, you know it's big because you can't see the other shore. I remember as a child, that fascinated me. 
I, I grew up in uh, uh, suburbs of Milwaukee, which is right on the shore of Lake Michigan. I think Lake Michigan is like, I don't know, 100 miles wide or more than that, some, some wide. <laughs> and I remember as a child being fascinated by the fact that I couldn't see the other shore. Mother would say, yeah, in that way, Michigan is on the other side. I can't see Michigan. As a child, that really amazed me. But even as, wouldn't it be nice to recover some of that amazement we had as children? Nice. Next time you go to, a, go to the ocean or a big lake, look, ar look across and remember our discussion. And remember the amazement you had as a child, not being able to see the far side. Then, so Sri Krishna says, among all the sacred rivers, I am Ganga. Among all bodies of water, I am the vast oceans or seas. Next, Ayudhanam. Amongst all weapons, Dhanush Aham. I am Dhanush, uh, the bow. Now you might wonder why, why bow? There's a reason for each one of these being selected. And we have to think about it a little bit why, why the bow. Most weapons you hold, you know, you know, uh, like a knife, a sword, this gada, this club you hold. A few weapons you can throw. You can throw a spear or something. But how far can you throw a spear? Not that far, but with his bow and arrow, with a powerful bow, that arrow can travel a long way. So that's why, amongst all weapons in ancient times, the, uh, that uh, bow and arrow was absolutely the most powerful. We've been making jokes about if this were written in modern times, Sri Krishna would have to say, among all weapons, I am... <laughs> <laughs> I am the thermonuclear bomb. <laughs> nice that we can laugh about it. We live in a world that's relatively safe. Relatively, not absolutely relatively safe. Some of you remember during the Cold War, we wouldn't have laughed, right? Because during the Cold War, it was a very real possibility that these bombs would rain out of the sky and wipe out what we know as civilization. So thank goodness we can laugh about it today. That's, that's a big improvement. Let's hope that we can laugh more and more as world leaders realize the impossibility of using such, such weapons. Then, last uh, line here. Prag uh, Tripuragnaha dhanushmatam. Um, dhanushmatam. Among wielders of the bow, among those who, the bow is the most powerful weapon, then whoever is wielding the most powerful weapon must be the most powerful warrior. And in the Bhagavad Gita, a similar expression comes, and not surprisingly, Rama is the most powerful wielder of a bow, but not here. <laughs> Instead of Rama, Tripura, ag, Tripura Gna. Gna means the one who kills. The one who kills Tripura is the name of an asura killed by Lord Shiva. This is a name for Lord Shiva. And we're going to see, this is one example, we're going to see more examples of how the Bhagavad Gita says Rama. This says Shiva. Why don't they say the same thing? Exactly. That's the point we've made here many, many, many times. These are spiritual teachings. These are rich with symbolism. These are not meant to be taken as historical truths. If it was a historical truth that Shiva was the greatest, then you couldn't say Rama. If it's a historical truth that Rama was the greatest, you couldn't say Shiva. So we have to change, we have to, what do you say, recalibrate our thinking about these scriptures. 
They are not history books. Okay, enough said. So we get another example of that right here. Okay, next. Dishnya namas myaham meru. Dishnya namas myaham meru. Gahana nam himalaya. Gahana nam himalaya. Vanaspati nam ashwatta. Vanaspati nam ashwatta. O shadi namaham yavaha. O Shadi Namaham Yama. Dishni is an abode where you live, where you reside, a dwelling. So Sri Krishna says, Aha, you see, Asmiaham, Asmi Aham. I am Dishnyanam among all abodes, among all dwelling places. I am. Meru, Mount Meru, considered to be the, the axis of the earth, the most central point, the most important point, the most spiritual point we see in the, in the stories. And Gahana Nam, uh, Gahana is that which is hidden, has other meanings as well. Among all hidden places, what makes something hidden is the fact that you can't get there. So amongst all hidden or inaccessible places, Sri Krishna says, I am the Himalaya, the abode of snow, Hima, the name of the famous mountain chain. And um, there were no roads <laughs> in ancient times. There were perhaps some footpaths, but even those those footpaths didn't go very far. Today, you can yeah, just, I, I like this irony. You can travel to sacred places in the Himalayas today by car and not by foot. Why? Some of you were raised in India and you know the reason. Because of India's war with China, <laughs> right? <laughs> Because there was a border dispute, India went to war with China, India lost that war, <laughs> and so to prepare for the future, they, they created all of these roads up in the Himalayas for the sake of, of defense, really speaking. And that's a lovely, lovely metaphor, the fact that roads that were created for the sake of defending the country against the Chinese these roads are now used by millions of pilgrims going up into the, uh, in, into the Himalayas. There's that nice statement in the, uh, in the Bible someplace where it says you should beat your swords into plowshares. It means that the metal that was used to make a sword, you should reforge that metal and turned it into a, the, the blade of a plow. So what an excellent example of converting blades, into converting that which is an, an, uh, related to war and converting it into something related to spiritual growth going on these pilgrimage. Then, Vanaspati Nam, among all Vegetation, all forms of vegetation. Sri Krishna says, I am the Ashwatha, the sacred fig tree, people tree, um, sometimes called banyan tree. I think maybe botanists will make some more precise distinctions among these. But we, in the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna, in the beginning of the 15th chapter, uses this brilliant metaphor about an Ashwatha tree, actually an upside down Ashwatha tree. And it's so rich with symbolism that a metaphor actually comes earlier in the Upanishads. Just a wonderful, wonderful uh, metaphor. But apart from metaphor, it's a pretty amazing tree. 
What other tree do you know that could occupy one acre of land? They grow, they spread out horizontally. And some of you have seen these trees that, that grow and grow and grow. In this country, they grow tall. If you've seen the, uh, the uh, giant sequoias in California, pretty amazing trees. So th those grow tall, these grow laterally. It's just amazing. In fact, if Sri Krishna lived in America, <laughs> he would probably say, amongst all trees, I am the giant sequoia. <laughs> all right. Then, Oshadhi Nam. Oshadhi is herb. Vanaspati is vegetation in general. Oshadhi, we would translate usually as herb, uh, plant. And Sri Krishna says, Aham Yavaha. Yava uh, often means just barley, but it refers to any grain whatsoever. And the idea is you can live eating grains. Not just yava, but wheat and rice and everything else. So all grain-producing plants. Sri Krishna says, I, among all plants, I am the grain-producing plants because they sustain civilization. This is another thing. We take this stuff for granted. We don't think. 10,000 years ago, which is not that long ago, right? This planet has been around for 4 billion years. Human beings have been around for about 1 million years. But up until about 10,000 years ago, there was no such thing as agriculture. That's shocking. A mere 10,000 years ago, agriculture was developed. That's mind-boggling, because up until that time, people were nomads. You'd kind of roam around, and you hunters and gatherers. The whole idea of civilization began with cultivation, right? Prior to cultivation, there was no such thing as civilization as we know it. And it's, to me, it's amazing that it is only 10,000 years old. So Sri Krishna here is hinting at the importance of cultivation by showing the, he says, I am, those grain-producing plants, the, one, the plants that sustain people. Then, Puro, huh? Yeah. Puro dhasam vashishto ham. Puro dhasam vashishto ham. Brahmhishta nam brahaspati. Brahmhishta nam brahaspati. Skando ham sarva se nanyam. Skando ham sarva se nyanam. Agranyam Bhagavan Ajaha, Agranyam Bhagavan Ajaha. Purodhas is the name of a, of a category of priest. So Purodhasam, among all priests, Sri Krishna says, Aham, I am the one known as Vasishta, a great, great sage. Of course, you might wonder, why, why would he say Vasishta? Why wouldn't he say um, Brahaspati? After all, Brahaspati was the priest in the heavenly lokas, the priest of the gods. So when the gods wanted to do a, a some kind, you would call it heaven. They didn't call it heaven. But when the priests wanted to do a heaven, they had to, I'm sorry, when the gods in heaven wanted to do a heaven, who did they phone up? They didn't phone up anyone, <laughs> but Brahaspati was their priest. So you might wonder, why does Sri Krishna says, among all priests, he should have said, I am Brahaspati, and the reason why is in the next line, Brahaspati is better than that. He says, Brahmishtanam, among all, could be great Brahmanas, or even better, among all enlightened beings, among all knowers of Brahma, Brahman, I am Brahaspati. So Brahaspati was the priest of the gods or the guru of the gods. 
also enlightened. So for that reason, Sri Krishna says, I am Prahaspati, skandaha aham, sarva senyanam, um, sarva sen, senanyam, among all leaders of armies. Who has the, the most powerful army? So you can have an army of, in modern times, the size of armies is just mind-boggling. Right now in, in Russia and Ukraine, they're fighting with armies that number in the hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. In the Vietnam War, at one point, this country had half a million soldiers in Vietnam. No wonder everyone complained. Half a million soldiers. That sounds like a, a lot of soldiers. I think, if, if I remember right, Saddam Hussein had the mother of all armies. <laughs> I think he had at one point a million enlisted uh, soldiers. So whoever has the biggest army, except what if it's an army not of human beings, an army of gods? <laughs> so the story is that Skanda, who is the son of Lord Shiva, according to the uh, stories, Skanda ended up as the head of the army of the devas. They had 30,000, that's the number that comes. They had 30,000 devas in this army. They fought and defeated asuras. And I think we can assume that 30,000 devas are mightier than Saddam Hussein's 100 million soldiers. So among all leaders of armies, Sri Krishna says, I am Skanda, the leader of the army of gods. And finally, agrani is that which comes first. Of all those agranyam, of all those who come first, Sri Krishna says, aham, I am Bhagavan Ajaha. I am the unborn Lord, probably a reference to Brahma, Brahmaji, God as creator. So among all gods, I am God as creator. That's such an easy one to appreciate. We're talking about appreciation of the glories. I think I mentioned in a prior class, you go out at night in a remote place and look up at the sky when the sky stars are burning brightly and clearly. We don't have all this haze and light pollution like we have here in New Jersey. You see those stars burning so brightly and so clearly. How can you not appreciate that everything that exists has a source? Nothing is self-existent. Who and what was that source? How can you fail to appreciate that? Maybe some people can. I don't know how they can. All right, continuing. Yajnanam Brahma Yajnoham Yajnanam Brahma Yajnoham Vratanam Avihimsanam Vratanam Avihimsanam Vayavagnarkam Bhuvagatma Vayavyagnarkam Bhuvagatma Shuchi Nama Yaham Shuchihi Shuchi Nam Hapyaham Vayu Agni Arka Ambu and Vag. We'll come to that in just a minute, breaking the words apart. Yajnanam, among all rituals. Which ritual is the greatest of all rituals? Sri Krishna says, I am that greatest of ritual. Do you think the greatest ritual is one that uses a maximum number of priests or has a maximum number of offerings consuming the maximum amount of ghee? What does he say? He says, among all, all sacrificial rituals, 
he says, I am Brahma Yajna. Here Brahma means Veda. Veda Yajna means recitation of the Vedas. Among all sacrificial rituals, Sri Krishna says, I am Vedic recitation as a ritual. And the importance of that can't be understated because it was ritualistically chanted. There was a, the brahmanas would get together and chant the Vedas as a ritual, which had a very important side effect. The main reason of chanting it, of course, was to worship Ishvara, Yajna. But the, there was an interesting side effect, and the side effect is that by doing so, at that time, the Vedas were only an oral form. There were no written forms of the Vedas. So it was through this ritualistic recitation that the Vedas were preserved for future generation because the ancient, because these old brahmanas performed this ritual, we can study the Vedas today. If they didn't, did not have this ritual, perhaps the Vedas would not have survived. We don't know. So for this reason, Sri Krishna says, among all ritual sacrifices, I am Vedic recitation. Then vrtanam, among all vows. Sri Krishna says, I am the himsanam. Himsa, harm. Ahimsa or vihimsa means the same thing. So vihimsa nam, I am the vow of ahimsa. A vow taken by every sannyasi. Whether they follow that vow or not is another matter, but a very important vow. They're, they're, basically, there's only, uh, sannyasi makes only two vows. Only two. Buddhists, I think, have... 328 or some number. Anyway, they have a lot of vows. Uh, a Hindu sannyasi has exactly two. One is renunciation. Anything not concerned with spiritual growth is given up. The second vow, vihamsanam, ahimsa. That non, uh, it, they call it in, in the terms used is abhaya. Abhaya data. It's to give fearlessness to all beings, to declare in the vow, you actually declare, I am not to be feared by all living beings. That's the translation of the vow taken by any sannyasi. And what a beautiful vow, because that's the essence of dharma, as we've discussed so many times. Then, and last line, go down, shuchinam, among all things that are purifying, Sri Krishna says, Aham Shuchihi, I'm the purity of all things that purify. Well, what are those things that purify? That was that long compound that I stumbled over in the third line. The first of those purifying things are Vayu. Now, again, here we have to put ourselves into this ancient world view. So in ancient times, did they have the soap in a squeeze bottle. How convenient that is, whatever it is. You just squeeze that soap, or you know, for your hands, you have that push thing and all. Yeah, anyway, just so incredibly convenient. If you lived in ancient India, what would you use to clean things? Actually, one of the main, main things that were used to clean, if you had a dirty pot in ancient times, Obviously, you don't put it in your dishwasher, nor do you squirt soap into it. I don't think they had soap as, as we know it today. One of the most common ways of cleaning pots is you put some clay and water in that pot. You scour it with the clay and rinse it with the water. And clay is clean compared to <laughs> many other things. Okay. But here, the references are to the, the purifying things, Include vayu, air. Air will dry things, things that remain damp. 
and especially in South India where things can be very damp, you get a lot of this mold and mildew. So air dries things out and is purifying. Agni, this is the obvious purifying thing. If you have something you really want to be pure, it goes into the fire. That's why the steel tumblers and steel plates, they can go into a fire without being damaged. Then the next purifying agent is Arga, the sun. You put something out in the sun and wind, and that object is purified. And the final one, that Atma means it, the nature of. So the purifying things are Vayu Atma, made of Vayu, Agni Atma, made of Agni, etc., etc. But the last one is, in this list is Vak, speech. That may seem a little bit out of place, except for the fact that there are many mantras that are recited for the sake of purification. Before you eat a meal, you might recite a mantra of purification before taking that food. So therefore, the last in this list is Vak, speech. So among all purifying agents, all of those are Sri Krishna. Next. Yoga nam hatma samrodho, Yoga nam hatma samrodho, Mantros me vijagi shatam, Mantros me vijagi shatam, Unviksha ki kaushal yanam, Unviksha ki kaushal yanam, Vikalpa kyati vadinam, Vikalpa Kyati Varinam Yoga Nam Among all kinds of yoga, among all kinds of spiritual practice in a more general sense, Sri Krishna says, I am Atma Samrodha. Samrodha, restraint. Atma can be restrained. Not such a Dananda Atma, but Atma has, can, Atma functions like a pronoun and it can have different meanings. It simply means self, and in this case it would refer to both body and mind. So Atma Samrodha here means restraint of your body and mind. Sri Krishna says that is the most important spiritual practice because, obviously, if you don't control your body and mind, how can you be successful in any pursuit, much less a spiritual pursuit? You get the point. Then, mantraha asmi, vijagishatam. If you know a little Sanskrit, this may confuse you because vijagisha is one who wants to be successful, one who wants to conquer, one who wants to come out on top. So, for those who seek victory, Vijagi Shatam, Sri Krishna says, Asmi, I am mantra. And that may lead you to think, oh, there's a special mantra you should chant for the sake of victory. And there are some people who take this kind of thing very seriously, followers of this Tantra Vidya, and people are looking for that. People. There's something about human nature. Everyone wants the shortcut. <laughs> Please tell me that mantra. If I chant that mantra, I get everything I want. I don't have to work for it. I don't have to try. I don't have to make any effort. How lazy. <laughs> anyway, a common human trait, not just in modern times, but perhaps in ancient times, except here, mantra doesn't mean mantra. But what does that mean? Our most common meaning of mantra is a Sanskrit expression recited for the sake of meditation. But that is not the only definition of mantra. If you look up in a dictionary, you'll find many meanings. And if you look up the root meaning of mantra, there also you'll find many meanings. Have you ever wondered why a, a minister in India is called mantri? Do they chant mantras? 
highly unlikely. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know. Um, so it suggests that mantra has other meanings. In this case, mantra means advice. And uh, the commentator says, niti, political, mm, niti, correct political advice. Niti, correct political advice. That's the meaning of mantra in this context. So for those who want to be victorious, those who want to be successful, what should they do? Get proper advice. That's some, some people like to go it on their own. And it's a, t a typical male thing. Don't tell me what to do. I know. We can all do better. You may know, but we can all do better in life with some appropriate advice. Then, skan, oh, where, where am I? There we go. Anvikshiki kaushalya nam. Among kaushalya, kaushalya is skill here. Among all, among all the skills that a peop, that a person can possess, what is the most important skill for the sake of living. And Sri Krishna gives a perfect example here. Anvikshaki. In inquiry, thinking, and especially, yeah, just inquiry. Yeah, that's how it, that's how he translated. Just inquiring and especially something um, this is a, a big issue for everyone when we're younger, and that is we don't consider the consequences of our actions. So, anvikshana means a kind of inquiry, and certainly a kind of inquiry where you consider the consequences of your actions. By the way, that's a problem not just for teenagers, right? <laughs> Grown adults also act without fully considering the consequences of their actions. Means, get some advice to go back to the prior, prior line. Finally, vikalpaha kyati vadi nam. Kyati vadi, in general, is a philosopher, but it's actually a technical term that refers to a specific branch of philosophy. If there is such a thing, the most useless branch <laughs> of philosophy and the most useless branch of philosophy in, spir in the spiritual world where there are commentators who go on arguing about this stuff uh, endlessly, the most useless kind of philosophy is a discussion about the nature of ignorance. Kyati here means ignorance. By studying ignorance, what do you hope to gain? <laughs> <clears throat> but it turns out there are five different theories about ignorance. And people, not, not ordinary people, but these crazy scholars love to argue about these five different theories of ignorance and what do they get out of that? Out of that, they get. In, I think they get headaches. I get a headache anyway if I start studying that kind of stuff. So he says, of of <laughs> of those who study this useless philosophy, arguing about different kinds of ignorance, um, Sri Krishna says, I am their vikalpa. I am their disagreements and debate. That unending debate. Another good unending debate is a debate between free will and destiny. People love to debate this. These debates go on endlessly and you get nothing out of those debates except a headache. All right. <laughs> then. Srinam tu shatarupaham, Srinam tu shatarupanam, Pum sam swayam bhuvo manu, 
Om Sam Swayam Bhuvo Manuhu Narayano Muni Nancha Narayano Muni Nancha Kumaro Brahmacharinam Kumaro Brahmacharinam Strinam tu, tu, but among all women, among all women, Sri Krishna says, I am Shatarupa. Now, Shatarupa literally means the one who has a hundred forms, but it happens to be the name for the wife of Manu in the mythology. Manu, we know, as the progenitor of all mankind. Well, Manu couldn't do it alone for obvious reasons, so with his wife, Shatarupa, he becomes the progenitor for all mankind, which is why the, in the next line, Pumsam, among all men, Swayam Bhuvaha Manuhu, I am that Manu. So I am Manu and the wife of Manu, the ones from whom all human beings have descended. Just this, to me, this hints at another glory that we take for granted. If Sri Krishna were saying this in modern times, I have no doubt that he would say something about evolution. Because evolution is why we sit here today. You all know that we started off as single-celled critters and then through a process that took one million, that, I'm sorry, that took approximately four billion years. This planet is four and a half billion years. Human beings have been around for one million years. One fortieth of the length of the universe. I'm trying to use these numbers to make them more, give you some sense of, of magnitude. So over one, over four billion years, we, there was a natural process of random mutation and natural selection. Random mutation means when these one-celled critters uh, split and duplicated, occasionally they messed up. Most of the time when they messed up, it had bad consequences. Occasionally when they messed up, they had good consequences. And through a process of natural selection, the good consequences survived, the bad consequences died off, and you and I sitting here today are the result of four billion years of random mutation and natural selection. I don't know why some Christians are so against this. To me, that is, the, if God has any glory at all, this is something spectacular. That the creation, which is due to the intelligence of the creator, that due to that intelligence, we have a universe in which human beings can evolve. That's the glory of God. Then you might wonder, well, then why are these Christians so against it? And for a very unfortunate reason, and that is their Bible says something different, and they take it very literally. The Bible says that God created Adam and Eve, or in Sanskrit, God created Manu and Shatarupa. <laughs> How's that for mixing up traditions? Anyway, God created Adam and Eve, which means according to that very literal, strict interpretation of the uh, Bible, they then reject the possibility of evolution in spite of tremendous scientific evidence. I just, I, I sigh because it's just amazing how many 
highly intelligent people are able to turn off their intellects and just accept the literal word of God, as it were, in the Bible. I, I told this anecdote before when I was a young uh, engineer. A colleague of mine was a devoted Christian. He was also really intelligent. And I asked him, how can you believe this stuff? And he says, I just turn off my intellect. He said that. <laughs> because if you read the Bible with your intellect turned on, it doesn't work. You have to turn it off. And what a shame. God gave us these powerful intellects. So we decide to turn them off in religious matters. Do you see how silly that is? God gave us these spectacularly intelligent minds. Don't you think that God would intend for us to use those minds when it comes to religious and spiritual matters? Of course. Then why is it that to follow the Bible as it's usually taught, you have to sacrifice your intellect. And I don't think I'm being, I'm mis I do not think that's a misrepresentation because Christians say again, faith alone is what, what the focus is on. So faith alone means don't be distracted by your intellect. If your intellect becomes a distraction, turn it off. And to me that is incredibly sad because not only does it prevent us from understanding who God, Ishwara, truly is, but it's just, it's just sad. I'll just leave it at that. Okay, let's finish this up. Where are we? Uh, so, Adam and Eve. <laughs> and evolution. So, absolutely. If Sri Krishna were writing this today, He'd say, among all natural laws, I am the law of evolution. I am, I am random mutation and natural selection. Absolutely. Then, Narayanaha Muni Namcha. Among all Munis, among all sages, Sri Krishna says, I am Narayana. Narayana here does not mean Lord Vishnu. Narayana here is a reference to yet another mythological story found in the Bhagavata Purana and elsewhere, the story of Nara and Narayana. Some of you know those two names. They were, they were sages. They were also brothers. And they were considered partial incarnations of Lord Vishnu. And then in some places you'll actually find that Nara became Arjuna, and Narayana became Sri Krishna. We find this in these, these stories. So here, Narayana is that particular Muni or sage. And finally here, Kumaraha Brahmachari Nam. Brahmachari, we can understand it as one who practices celibacy. So among all those who practice celibacy. So Children and, and teenagers can and should <laughs> practice celibacy. Um, adults generally don't unless you become a sannyasi. There are also some nitya brahmacharis, those who take, a, even though they don't become a sannyasi, they practice celibacy um, from youth onwards for the sake of spiritual growth. And let's make it very clear. So, Celibacy is not the key to spirit. Some people really put unhelpful spin on spiritual teachings. And by elevating the importance of celibacy, in my opinion, that is putting an unnatural spin on these spiritual teachings. The basic idea of celibacy is to have a life free of distractions. That's all it is, a life free of distractions. Distractions not like a spouse, distractions like a family, like a house, like a career, all of that. That's really the idea of it. If you want to have a, a life 
free of distractions, be celibate and live in a cave. That's it. So, on the other hand, for the vast majority of people, that's a very unhappy, unpleasant lifestyle. So therefore, celibacy is, I'm sorry, having families is a normal part of life. So let's just understand pragmatically that to elevate the, the, um, the, the importance of celibacy is an unhelpful spin on spiritual teachings. There happens to be one narrow school of yoga that has some purpose in being celibate. But the number of people who follow that narrow school of yoga, that practice, they're incredibly few. So if you're practicing spiritual growth in general, it's, it's not an issue. Now, let's finish this verse off. Who would be the best of all celibates? What a funny question to ask. But there's an interesting answer. And that is, you could be celibate for the earliest part of your life, or you could be celibate for you know, most of your life, or you could be celibate for all eternity. <laughs> and those who are celibate for all eternity, we saw in a prior chapter, the four Kumaras, the four mind-born sons of Brahmaji, who are celestial beings, they are eternally presented as being young and therefore uh, not engaged in any kind of sexual activities. And those four, four Kumara, among those four Kumaras, he says, Kumara here really free, probably refers to Sanat Kumara, among those four, among Sanaka, Sanandana, Sanatana, and finally Sanat Kumara. So among all celibates, Sri Krishna says, I am Sanat Kumara, the one whose celibacy is not for a lifetime, the one whose celibacy is eternal. Okay, but please do not get stuck in this. You know, I, I'm pausing because there, there's the, the spin. I am holier than you are. Why? Because I'm celibate. Give me a break. Celibacy is just one tiny aspect of your lifestyle. Small. Why elevate it to such an important position? It's absurd. And it's one of the many misinterpretations of our scriptures that sadly the misinterpretations really have gained traction. So let's understand it as a misinterpretation. This is a good place to conclude. We have a few more of these glories to go, which is glorious. <laughs> Sorry, that's pretty bad. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> let's finish up here. Uh, quick announcements. Tomorrow we have our Vedanta class at 10 o'clock. Come and join us, Upadesha Sahasri of Shankara. And at 6 p.m. is our satsang. Hopefully the weather will be nice. Last weekend, you know, it was supposed to rain. It didn't. And we had a lovely time sitting out here. We don't know if it'll rain or not tomorrow. If it does rain, of course, we'll sit inside. So come join us with your questions. We'll conclude with our prayers. Om Ganana Hantva Ganapati Gumma Vamahe Kavinga Vidam Upama Shravastamam Jaystarajam Brahmanam Brahmanas Patahana Shranvan Utabasira Sadanam Om Mahaganapatahe Namaha Ishwaro Guru Hatmeti Murti Bheda Vibhagine Vyomavad Vyapta Dehaya 
Dakshina Murtaye Namaha Vasudevasutham Devam Kam Sachanuramardanam Devaki Paramhanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makascha Dukha Bhagavet Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Hamratangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Tat Sat.